Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, lax rats alike, welcome back to another episode of The Crease Dive. Today is Tuesday, May 3rd, and Chris Gray is your all-time leader in career points in men's Division I college lacrosse history. I'm Jordy from Barstool. With me, as always, we've got Dukes on the mic. Dukes, huge weekend. Chris Gray getting the record. A uh, few big games setting everybody up for conference tournaments. Couple names jumping into the transfer portal, so we got a lot to get going into today. How you feeling? Great. I mean, a Long Island guy now ha- holds the career points record, so I guess this just definitively says that Long Island is the best hotbed for lacrosse. Is that what people are saying? I've seen that take a lot on lacrosse Twitter, but I'm glad I, it's home. I, I think for sure, and I, and I think what it really says is just that Shoreham, Wading Rivers easily the best high school on on the <laughs> island and like really there's there's no need to even consider any other high schools on long island um but yeah chris gray the listen a lot of people have played division one college across rosters are pretty big sports been going on for a while now a lot a lot of people can say hey i i played i played d1 lax nobody in the world except for chris gray at this very moment can say not only did I play Division One lacrosse, but I also scored 401 points in my career. So, uh, I mean, you think about all of the legends who have played, right? Like, insane. Of course, of, of course, you've got your, you know, your, your random nobodies who just snuck onto a D1 roster and whatever. Like, good for them. But you've got guys like Gary Gate, guys like Casey and Mikey Powell, guys like Lyle Thompson, who before the other night was the only one who could ever say that he had 400 points. Uh, Chris Gray surpassed them all. He needed five points in UNC's final game against Duke uh, to be able to tie Lyle's record. He needed six to break it, did it in vintage Chris Gray fashion with a nice little question mark fadeaway jumper uh, to get 401, obviously a little, little nod to Rob Pinnell there. Uh, So, I mean, a couple things here, I guess, you know, one, um, that it, it puts a, a nice little bow on a, on a shit season for UNC. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a good way for them to go out on a pretty crappy season. Um, and, you know, pretty much, you know, puts a, puts a really so, almost like the opposite. It was like a, a bittersweet ending for, it was, it was like a sweet, bitter ending for, uh, for unc but a bitter no maybe the other way around maybe i'm thinking too much bittersweet for unc sweet bitter for uh for chris gray there because he did everything he could uh to you know lead that team to hopefully get him one more ncaa tournament appearance uh, and just everything that he did still wasn't enough so a uh, tough way for his career to end but also on a on a pretty high note we and uh, this is a, actually a point this just Overall to UNC, we talked about how Chris Gray was kind of a one-man show this year. But he did have no supporting cast, but it's kind of crazy to even say. Because they had, like, the number one class coming in that were freshmen. They had, like, got, returning players like Lance Tillman. Um, I can't believe that the UNC season shook out this way. But it, it's I'm just happy that Chris Gray could look back at his final year and have be able to, like, be proud of something. He's a great player. But, look... He might be the all-time uh, mid-major major performance guy now. No, Pat Lax. I mean, I mean, you. It well. Here's the thing. So now, Patriot League all-time players. Do you go first two seasons of Chris Gray at, at BU, and then take into consideration how he finished out a season, or do you go or his career, or do you go all four years of Pat Spencer? Is Lyle Thompson a mid-major player? Oh, you know what? Yeah, actually, yeah. Because the American, like, I mean, no offense to all, but yeah. It, it's crazy to say, like, of course, but, like, he made them so nationally relevant. Like, it felt like every Friday they were on ESPNU. Like, it's like, like if you looked at, like, the, the, the years before Lyle Thompson was there at Albany and the years after, I'd call them a mid-major. But when they were, when the Thompson trio was there, I, they were they were they were right there with Duke in <laughs> national. Yeah, violence. I mean, I'm 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 trying to think about like another, trying to think of another example of of something like that, and I can't really off the top of my head. Um, so I don't want to kind of force anything here, but yeah, like he made them primetime television. Like he made the Dane train a thing. Like they were they were the team to watch if you wanted just explosive highlight real goals. Um, so 
you know, maybe, maybe Chris Gray didn't have that overarching, uh, you know, just completely rebranding of a team and, you know, a, a, just an identity, mm-hmm. um, you know, because UNC, the, I mean, they had already won a national championship before he got there. Yeah. Um, you know, they played in final four. So it's not like he like completely reinvented UNC lacrosse. Um, he did bring them to the final four last year. So like, you know, I, I have to assume that's, that's enough to say mission accomplished on that, on that transfer. I'm sure that he would have liked another go at it this year. Probably sure. not going to happen. Can't imagine that they're getting into the tournament. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Like it, it's tough to, it's tough to compare what what the two of those guys did um just because you know lyle maybe not single-handedly you know brought that entire uh program up to to national relevancy you know he had his brother uh he had blaze for you know a couple seasons there um so i mean but like without lyle does does the Dane train ever happen? Does Albany really take off? Like, do they become a team that like people were so invested in for all those years? Not a chance. Um, But either way, I mean, 401 points is, is 401 points and can't take that away. I mean, it's actually crazy. I I gotta, I gotta bring up the list right now, but like just how insane the past few, like how spoiled, how spoiled we've been of, of great college across over the last few years. Like you, you go Chris gray, this year lyle thompson within the last 10 years pat spencer's right there um fields. i mean we have yeah fields right there we have the the all-time uh career leading goal scorer in in justin gutterding just a few years ago michael sowers right there like over the past few years record book has just been completely rewritten well do you remember when pinnell i think pinnell broke it first and he he did the fifth year so he had like the the injury so he's able to come yeah. back and people were like, oh, that's remember, I remember it's like a big conversation that it was kind of a fluke because he got to play extra games. Yeah. But, but it's just but crazy. I mean, like, it, it wasn't I think, because I it's think, like the, I'm, the I'm, tournament and everything, but yeah, like I'm pretty sure, I don't, I don't know. I, I think I, I saw this number floating around there. Like, I think that Chris Gray only did it in one more game. 71 and that, Lyle had 70. Yeah. Yeah. Then, yeah. So, and like you figure, well, actually, no. It's not. It's not like Chris Gray really had that many more tournament games than than Lyle had. He had the he he had his run last year to go to the Final Four, but other than that, that's that's all the tournament action he's had. There's two. There's two schools with two players in the top ten: Duke, who has Donowski and Gutty, and Albany Thompson and Fields. That's crazy to me. And if you look at the mid majors, I mean, you got Asher Nolting at ten. You got Jay Vasta. I didn't know, know who Jay Vasta is and what he was doing to defenders back in like the eighties. I think I've been hearing because he's he's at number nine for Air Force. He must have been doing people dirty. Um, that was a name that I, I had to even look up. But you have High Point on the list, Air Force on the list, Albany twice, and then you got Loyola. It's just crazy. Yeah, and like I I'm, I try to think about like okay, like are we seeing just like significantly better players nowadays? And it's like. I, I like on it's in general, I, 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 I would say a lot of it is shot clock. Like I, I think that there are more great players in lacrosse now than there were. Like, I, I think like, like we're not seeing people who are like better than Mikey Powell or better than Gary gate. We're seeing people who are on the same level, but I think that there are just, there are more players that are of that caliber than there were back then. But so I, but I, yeah, I think shot clock has a lot to do with it. I'm sure that stick technology helps a little bit. Um, but like I, I think that we're just seeing so many guys though enter that top ten list like recently over the either this year currently or within like the past like five six years, um, just because like just so many more guys who are coming in that are just fucking nasty. Do, are people ready for a take quick? Hold up, let me let me buckle in real this, quick. Let me get myself hands and look, feet inside the car at all time. Go ahead. I've been I I've, I've held this in for like a while because it's just I don't want to like disrespect anyone and like I'm just thankful for the game. But at what point do we start saying that like Gary Gate played against a bunch of like plumbers and shit? Like seriously, there's there is a point to be made that these old players like yeah they changed the game like yeah, they're the greatest of all time and I'll give them that respect. But like, why don't we just gonna sit around and be like, no, Michael Sowers would fucking dust Gary Date. Like he'd have fucking 500 points in the 90s. But like, it's the same thing as like Jordan. You look at these like Jordan Lebron debates. 
or like just players in the nineties. Like you're either like no, these players couldn't play today, like in the nineties, or they could. Like it, there's gonna yeah, come, but then there's like, gonna come a point, then, Jordy. There's gonna come a point where people start asking if Gary Gate was playing against Plumbers. But then like you look at like Petro highlights, and you're like, oh wait, no, never mind. Like that was a badass dude with a pole. For like, sure, we look at Dennis Rodman, and he's like, we're like, he's a beast. But like okay, but 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 on on a whole. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, on a whole, like it's just gonna, there's gonna come to a point where I'm just saying, like I'm not, I'm not saying this. I'm just saying people have to brace themselves that people are gonna start coming out of the woodworks and be like, oh, the, 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 the players are just way more skilled nowadays. Like the game is just well, in a better place. Yeah, but I, th- I think that all like the the Jordan takes are like that because he just still has so many like records, right? Like yeah, like it's like, the same thing as like, 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 like same yeah, same same thing as Gretzky, where it's like yeah, like people are like yeah, well he, he played against like. You know, goalies who like well, barely even knew how to like, yeah, yeah. They, they were wearing like a pillow pad, maybe if they were lucky, and then like they, they would just flop around all the time. The I don't goalies think today that are was, so good. But but what I'm saying is I don't think that we'll have to really go down that road with Gary Gate as far as like college lacrosse goes because like he doesn't have that. Like people are just like he was, yeah, like he's like the goat, but he doesn't have all those records that people are like, well, he only has the records because he was playing against fair. players. That's, a, that's actually, that's actually a very fair rebuttal. And I'm not even, I don't know why I was attacking Gary Gate there. Mostly. It's just like players. In you like, don't, yeah. You don't want to go down that unless it's for a suit. We can yeah, attack the suit. All we just want players, we in, all... players in general that played in the nineties or the eighties or like, even like you could, you could even maybe, you could maybe even go back as early as the early two thousands. I, you're, I know yeah. you're not going to like that. I know you're not going to like that. I know that's bitter, bittersweet, but, like, I, and we, we both agree that, like, these records are in place and that they, it keeps getting broken because of the faster tempo and, like, the fact that these offensive players, they don't have to stall the ball anymore. There's no, like, keep it in warning. It's a completely different game. So these offensive players are at somewhat at an advantage, but the, lacrosse is just way more skilled nowadays. Like, you look at – the, the, like a Lizards Cannons game from 2001, and then you look at Duke UNC last night, and I showed you both films, and I'm like, guess which one was a professional game? If I took the jerseys away, you'd be like, well, that's a JV game, and that's <laughs> that's a JV game with grown men, and then that's like the most skilled players I've ever seen in my life. I'm I'm still I'm a little hesitant because I I do think I th- I think that there are guys who were in the 90s who were ju- like like e- even or. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I guess like not like a guy like Mark Millen. I think Mark Millen, in his time, if if you took Mark Millen of his time and you put him in today's game, I think that he's still great. For sure. The only thing is, but but the only thing is, I don't think that he's like that as much better than anybody else than he was at his. T- like I think that there are guys that 100%. are right there with him. So 100%. it's like it's it, it, it's like were they worse? No, but like. They have to go up against better competition now, I, so it's like I'm fair with that. Yeah, and also okay. their their stick technology and stuff. Like I'm saying, like with their sticks and everything, like just like who they were going against. I'm sure, like if Mark Millen was growing up, like he had the same exact life, but it just fast forwarded it now. He he, like there's no saying how many points he'd have in the NCAA with these rules well, and everything. Well, I, I think we're watching exactly what it would be like with his son at. Yeah, yeah, Jesus Christ. I saw one of his passes. So. Come on. I saw one of his passes. <laughs> oh, oh, my the skip pass, oh, my the, God. The, the kid cutting from X oh, and then God. the little skip across. Horny. That was so Horny. nasty. Yeah. Well, uh, you can't really say that when it comes to high school kids, but yeah. <laughs> not, not him, the pass. <laughs> uh, but either way, well, so we're talking about all this Chris Gray points, um, you know, bre- breaking the record. One, because it's awesome, but two, because Duke played UNC. Uh, on Sunday and put the little beat down on them. It was, it was actually, it was a tight game for a little while. Then the second half started and Duke was like, uh, Oh yeah, we forgot. It's, it's now may and it's time to, to turn on may Duke and also UNC is just Mm -hmm. putrid this year. Uh, so Duke, they, they put away UNC pretty handily. That was a 19 to 11 final, uh, big game out of Nakai. Really, really upped his draft stock on that one. Sure. Good game out of Joe Rob, uh, Dyson Williams with a few, few quality finishes. So um, definitely weird where like the major talking point of a team getting shelled and losing by eight goals was talking about one of their offensive players. But it's not every day that someone breaks the all-time career points record. So congratulations to Chris Gray and uh, looking forward to what he's got in store when it comes to the PLL this summer. Uh, another ACC game. 
that went down on Sunday. Uh, Notre Dame, your Notre Dame fighting Irish laid the smack down on Syracuse. Uh, that seems to be just the running theme as Pat Cav loves to bully the orange. So I mean, uh, just, just, a, just a casual smooth little, little four and six game out of Pat Cav uh, two and two for Chris Cavanaugh. And I mean, that was just a game where you look at Pat Cavanaugh playing the sport of lacrosse you look at everybody else on the field and you say to yourself, there's, there's no way that they're playing the same thing because it's just on an entirely different level. I just, I, I whew, Jordy, I, I feel so good about this Notre Dame lacrosse team. They, and it, it we'll get into it, into it a little bit later. Just talking about like the play, like just next week, but Entman is, there's just not, not enough words to put, put in place 22 saves. Almost a seventy save percentage. He, he now does he play better in the dome though? I, look, I think that I don't know what the fuck Notre Dame has got going on in the pregame before they play Syracuse. Pat Pat Cav in, has had at least nine points. Every, like he he tied his own record for Notre Dame points ten, and he did that against Syracuse last year. He's had like nine, ten, and ten against Cuse. That is like like Syracuse. Chris. I mean, Pat Cav is, is Syracuse's daddy. I mean, there's there's no other way to twist it. He owns the dome. Like it's. I know the Carrier Dome is like getting a new name. It's called the Pat Cav Dome. That's what it's going to be referred to from now on. I mean, there, at some at some point, you just have to lock him off and just be like, like we're not we're not going to let Pat Cav beat us today. We're not going to let him beat us today. Because could you imagine showing up though into the you know maybe, maybe the the practice the day before and you get the assignment hey you have to lock off pat calf could you imagine how terrifying that would be and be like no like this dude is going to like fucking act like physically assault me for trying to stop him from getting the ball like no thanks i'd rather him just dodge on me tabletop me by going super low on his change of direction that change of direction we'll just, we'll just Little little inside roll getting. I mean, I I think that he licked the turf on his way out of that inside roll. Throws the defender right over his back, stuffs it in for was was that, that might have been his fourth goal of the game. Like that that was the point where it was just like okay, like this this is starting to get like like we might need to lawyer up. Like we might be seeing like a, a manslaughter on our hands here. I think his brother taught him that one a little bit. I think his brother taught him when when they when you feel it when you feel it high on the head, just change low. <laughs> they'll always they'll always go over you. Um, uh, great game, though. but yeah. So I mean, killer game out of Pat Cav as he's known to do against Syracuse. Big game out of Liam Mentiman. You had mentioned before in last week's episode that that he was going to be perfectly fine in the dome as he always is, since he's used to seeing those balls inside. Um, just a you know rough. Rough day all around for the majority of, you know, the Syracuse players. Uh, Jackson Burt Whistle, local guy here in Philly, nice little hat trick. Brennan Curry uh, scored more goals than than his father's that was a cool uh, c- career total. So that that's that's always a cool moment where yeah, you can go home really and cool. say, suck it, Dad. Uh, Tucker Dordovic, two goals on the day, uh, two goals out of 13 shots. The man shoots early and often. Uh, and and those appear to be the final two goals that Tucker Dordovic will score in a Syracuse orange uniform. It was announced uh, on Monday, May 2nd, uh, that Tucker will be uh, entering the transfer portal. So Tucker Dordovic getting out of Syracuse. He spent the last, you know, his, his whole career there. Uh, he's got that extra year of eligibility left, and he's looking to spend it elsewhere not entirely sure that I can blame him after, after the way that this season went, um, you know, also, you know, a lot of the guys that he came in with, uh, they're all graduating this year. So it's not like he has, I'm, I'm sure he's boys with the whole team, but like his guys who he came in. Yeah. He didn't with, get recruited by uh, Gator or are, anything. Yeah. So, uh, so Tucker Dordovic will be on the way out. Uh, a couple things here do like one, what, what do you think that that says as far as Syracuse goes where it's, you know, now, um, maybe, maybe looked at as a school where it's like, okay, let, let me, let me see if there are greener pastures somewhere else. And two, do you have any feel, any, any gut feelings for where Tucker Dordovic ends up? I, I have two answers to this. I'll start off with the Syracuse one. I think that this is more so just like, he's like, I'll give the gate, the gate Petramala error a chance. I'll finish it out with my guys that I kind of came in with, like you said, but look, he didn't get recruited by either of them. 
they have a kind of like a new era starting next year with like Spolina and all those five stars that are coming in. So like that's a big testament. If they can't win with those guys, I mean, then then you could really put the gate Petro era in be like, what the fuck's going on? It's definitely way too early to like say anything. I think everyone knows that, but maybe Tucker doesn't want to be like, there's like he kind of would be in the. It's kind of crazy to say because I also think that he could win the Tourton next year, but he kind of be in the shadow of Joey Spilina. Do you know what I'm saying? Like Spilina is coming in with this like number one, oh, he's, number he's one wearing, recruit, wearing 22. 22. Like so, like maybe he just doesn't want to be a senior in like kind of like the shadow, and he just wants to make finish off his career somewhere else. So that's how I kind of looked at it. I don't think like anyone would hold anything against Tucker, but I will say that it will be great. You know, we talk about Maryland a lot and how. I always say, like, yeah, they get it done, and they're a great, like, team. They're like Villanova basketball, but they don't ever have the guy that can maybe win the, the, the top dog trophy, the Tawaraton trophy. But it will be nice to see uh, Tucker Dordovic win the Tawaraton in, uh, in Maryland College Park next season. I mean, you, you think John Tillman has to have some sort of alert system oh for whenever, whenever, oh an all American, whenever an All-American pops up in the transfer portal, like, it has to get, like, sent immediately to his, his push notifications. And I think he's he just knew like, yesterday. I think he knew yesterday. Yeah, um, I, I think they've been I, in contact. I mean, I'm not. I'm not kidding when I say this. Like, I think that where else would he go? I'm serious. Like, I can't think of anywhere else he'd go. It makes so much sense. He wouldn't go to anyone that like in the ACC he played against. The only team I could think about is maybe like a Duke. I think that Duke does very, very well in the portal. Like, it's a great school, so he could finish up there. Nice weather, but I mean, you, you play in the Big Ten. You play for like probably the best the best program. You're not going to like a Virginia that you hate. You you want to know? Uh, I I, I want to start a rumor real quick. Um, and so I know what you're gonna say. But yeah, so so let's see if we can get this one some legs. So you you look back at the you know the history of the transfer portal. For the most part, it's still a relatively new phenomena in college across. But there has been a transfer before. We have to roll back the, the clocks to yesteryear where Zach Greer, he ends up leaving Duke and he gets his uh, his extra year of eligibility after uh, the NCAA and the Duke University institution absolutely boned all those kids by, um, you know, just punishing them for that scandal that was all based upon a series of fabulous lies. So Zach Greer has an extra year of eligibility. Uh, you know, his coach that he went into Duke with Mike Pressler, he ends up going to Bryant. So with his extra year of eligibility, Zach Greer follows Mike Pressler from Duke to Bryant. Now we're talking about how Tucker Dordovic, you know, he doesn't need to stick around in Syracuse because he wasn't, he wasn't draft or not drafted. He wasn't recruited uh, by Gary Gate or, or Petro. He was recruited by John Desco, John Desco, currently probably probably enjoying his life a little bit and not having to suffer through this horrendous Syracuse lacrosse season, but who knows, maybe, maybe coach Desco's missing the game a little bit, right? It's, it's okay. May beautiful weather. Like this is, this is a time that he's very familiar with. He's won quite a few national championships. Maybe he's feeling a little nostalgic. Maybe he's looking to, to hop on with a, with a program and kind of build up that program from, from the ground up kind of the same way that Mike Pressler's done with Bryant. So maybe, maybe there's a program out there that's looking to hire John Desco. And maybe as soon as John Desco gets hired at this, at this program, maybe he says, Hey, Tucker, you've come to play for me before. How about you come and play for me again? So I think that Tucker Dordovic ends up transferring wherever John Desco gets his next head coaching job next season. That's, that's the rumor. And I so far have not seen a single person out there deny it. I, I don't hate that theory. I don't hate that theory at all. I don't see where there'd be a program. Because here's my thing. I don't think that Desco's leaving New York. It's either that or he's going to Jacksonville. That was my – that's what, what I thought you were going to say. I thought you were going to oh, – I thought you were going to – Okay, the, I, like, I, I like that one too. I like the Galloway. I like the, I like Galloway, the Galloway connection. Angle. And, you know, maybe it's like the, like Galloway's like, hey, John, I'm – you you would love Florida. You need to get out of it. You need to go over, like retire down here. You can you I built this program just like you built Syracuse. I helped build up Jacksonville, but you know my time to move on to greener pastures is coming up. So how about you you coordinate the offense or the defense for like a couple seasons, maybe one or two. I leave. I go to a great school. I go to I go to a blue chip school. Maybe maybe Syracuse gets blown up. Maybe I go to Syracuse again. But you stay down here in Florida with all your friends. You can golf a lot. 
build up this program. You don't have to play in the ACC. You're playing in the SOCON. Job security's there. Maybe, maybe Tucker wants to finish off down there. Could, could you imagine if, if Galloway brought Desco down to Florida? He should. I mean, I, 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 I couldn't even up with that in the last five minutes, but, like, Desco should be on the staff at Jacksonville. Like, as, like, a coordinator, just, like, be able to coach. Like, you don't have to recruit. Yeah. You don't have to recruit. Galloway's got to do all the recruiting. You've, you've already got that that relationship there. You yeah. get to hang out, kick-ass weather. You bring in Dordovic. All of a sudden, yeah. All right. I like that one a little bit better. Dordovic to Jacksonville. Guarantee it. One more theory. The last theory that I could come up with is Dordovic to, like, just because he has the Western roots, does he just want to finish up? Like, is he a skier? Does he like to snowboard? Does he go, go to, miss, go to, go go to, to Denver? Like, go to Denver or Utah? Den- I could see it. Um, it. It just the, there's there's three scenarios in my head where I see Dordovic where he makes a decision. Does he want to take the academic route, like where he, like I'd be like, all right, maybe he just wants to go to like a Duke. Does he want to go where he's like, I just need to win a national championship and I want to up my to work on stance? That's when he goes to Maryland. Like if he's all about the national championship, I think he goes to Maryland, no doubt about it. Or does he want to be closer I'm- to home? Like there's just so many different things that he ha- like has to think about. Where I'm, I'm perfectly content on all of those possibilities. I l- think that the most chaos is the Jacksonville one, which is so that's that's where my rooting interest is is for is for Jacksonville. Would he Especially break, because would that'd he be a tough for- tough go for the Mercer Hive because for for the Mercer Hive to think that every every transfer wants wants to go wear the Mercer orange and then for for a SoCon rival to become transfer you, that would be that would be a tough go for them. Do you do you think that he'd put up four hundred plus point, points in uh, in one season in the SoCon? Well, no, I because I because oh, Asher Nolting hasn't, and I think I think Tucker should play attack. I like him his move to attack this year. Um, I'd like I'd like to see him. I don't know. He's gonna be so filthy at Maryland. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm already convinced that he's going to Maryland, but my rooting interest is is in. Uh, it would just shake shit up if he went to Jacksonville. Yeah, absolutely, and that would be fantastic. Um, speaking of shaking shit up, we finally were able to shake enough up in the Ivy League that we got a. Uh, we got four teams that are going to be battling it out for the conference tournament. So. You know, the five teams that were all tied there at first place. And then you also had Penn sitting there at sixth place at, at three and three. Um, we had Chris Jast on last week to try to figure out the different scenarios that could happen. I he, he did a good job explaining everything, but I still didn't understand a lick of it. So it all just came down to the games that were played this past weekend. And in the end, well, Brown, they, they took care of business. They put down Dartmouth. Mm-hmm. Um, Dartmouth is close but they just weren't even close to being close on Saturday. Um, Cornell was able to come out and have a a big time statement win over Princeton an 18 to 15 win. Uh, Gavin Adler had, had a few takeaway checks that were just absurd. Like he listened to the podcast. He listened to the podcast. I, I, I was watching the game and I was like that, this motherfucker. Because I called, I called out the Cornell defense. I was like, yeah, they're just not playing as well as I thought. You know, Adler came on strong. I was like, kind of disappointed the p- past few games. His box score. Did you see his box score? What did I it think was, he had? What like what like five CTOs? Yeah, uh, like eight ground balls, five CTOs. Eight ground ball, yeah. Dis- yeah, I mean, he he was an absolute menace, and just like some of those, like just the can openers that he threw. Like he's, I, I feel like he's like a high school coach's worst worst nightmare yeah. because he throws like so many of those one-handed checks that just land so clean and then you go out and your kids like attempt to throw it and they just get run by right away uh but yeah gavin adler definitely a problem definitely a defender who you don't want your number one to have to go up against in the tournament so um uh, you know that that's that's definitely going to be uh it's, it's going to be tough news for they're going to be playing against Yale uh, on, on Thursday or on Friday. The mm-hmm. Ivy League semifinals are on Friday. We're going to get to that 
in uh, in the second episode of the week. So we're not going to do any Ivy League previews this week. No. Uh, but yeah, Gavin Adler, huge game out of him. Um, you know, and then also just just a big game for CJ Kirst and gang uh, offensively, and they were able to get it done against Princeton. I, I know that you know you would you would mention you were low on them. I was I was never I never had a doubt against uh, I never had a doubt for Cornell, but you know they were on a they were on a tough tough little stretch right you know they had just squeaked out a win against Syracuse they had lost against Army they had lost against Brown like this was a team that needed to get going and going fast I think that they did that against Princeton uh, and then the other big game of the weekend Yale in overtime able to knock off the Harvard Crimson it was Thomas Bragg with the overtime game winner uh, huge games out of Matt Brandau, which is to be expected at this point. Mm-hmm. Uh, and freshman Chris Lyons just continues to be an absolute killer out there. He had five goals on the day. Uh, so Yale able to get that win. It was it was a win and you're in situation for everybody in the Ivy. Um, and then Penn with actually, I, I honestly still have no idea how Penn got in, but Brown, when in your end, they're going to be hosting the Ivy League tournament. We're going to have Larkin Kemp on a little bit later this week to, to break down the Ivy tournament because Larkin and the Bruno, they are buzzing right now. Uh, Cornell and Yale as the two and three seeds and then Penn there as the four. So your, your thoughts on the Ivy League action this weekend? Uh, Harvard Yale was one of was one of my favorite games. I, I mean, obviously Kyle Mullen um, going out wasn't wasn't great for the Crimson. Uh, I think that was definitely the X factor. I mean, Barnard gave it his best, but I don't think 22% save percentage is who you want riding in cage when you're going into into overtime. So it's nothing against him. I just think that Mullen, you know, a senior, uh, probably like the heart and soul of the team in, in, in a way, the defensive leader. Uh, when, when, when you get when you lose a guy like that, uh, it's tough. So, I mean, Bragg had a fucking phenomenal shot, so I had, it was a stinger. So I don't know if Mullen would even have had it. But, I mean, I just think that was the X factor. I, I, I was – Really pulling for Harvard. I mean, these are two teams that I've been kind of looking out for since the beginning of the year. You know, I said said it time and time again. I've been so impressed with this young core for Harvard. And then I bought Yale when everybody was out on Yale. When when they lose to Penn State, who bought Yale stock? I did. So, am I calling myself a genius? No, you guys are. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, again, like this is this is kind of. Uh, you know, similar thing, I guess, to like a Duke t- really like turning things on in May. Like this is this is a Yale team where, um, you know, there there aren't many kids left, right? So what do we got? 18, 19, 20, 21, mm-hmm. 22. So so like not many kids left at all on this roster who were there for that uh, championship run. I guess they would have probably been freshmen if 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 yeah. So I guess they're using their fifth year. So I mean the freshmen, and and then that's it. Um, so, you know, but still like Yale has been a program over the last few years who they've built up that standard of being, you know, one of the top dogs in the Ivy, a team that's going to make it until one of the final, you know, like two weekends of the college lacrosse season. Um, so I think that, you know, this is, this was a big win for them to make sure that that tradition keeps being built throughout. Like we kind of talked about that with Larkin a few weeks ago where, um, you know, they had missed you know, that, that, that 18 team and, and that even that 19 team, like they were just, they were, they were, it, it's, assholes. I, I keep trying. Yeah. Yeah. They were, they were big time ass. And like, that was like the culture at Yale where it's like, we're going to be the biggest pricks that you're going to play against. And we're also going to be nasty and you're going to have to fucking deal with it. Then you have 2020 getting canceled. You have 2021 getting canceled. You have all these kids who just haven't been around for that. I think that this win propelling them into the conference tournament and then definitely into the NCAA tournament. I think that like, this is now a good opportunity to keep like building that, like, Hey, listen, you young guys who haven't been here before, this is, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to be pricks and everyone's going to hate us. And that's, that's why you love us. Um, also on the other end, you know, a team that, you know, it's still finding out their identity under a new uh, head coach with Connor Busick. I think that that was also a huge win for, for huge. the Busick stock. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to buy high on the Busick stock huge. now um, because to be able to, to get themselves out of that slight funk, you know, two losses in a row and a tight win over Syracuse to be able to say, all right, let's, let's, let's bounce back. Let's take care of our shit. 
get ourselves in the conference tournament here. And then that'll put us, put us in a good position moving forward. Um, big time, big time Busick game. Yeah, that was, that was huge for Busick. And it was a dominant victory in my opinion. I mean, I know the box score probably didn't say it, but I think just contr- Cornell controlled, really controlled the tempo. I mean, these Ivy League games have been so high scoring. So high scoring. Yeah, I mean, you look, I mean, like, like Colter Mackesy got game. his, Sam English got his, but like, I, I don't know. You, you just, yeah, you, I, it, it, it was a, it was a score that seemed a little bit close, like just one of those Cornell games where it's like, this is, this is the better team right now. And there's, they're, they're not going to lose that. I saw, I don't know. I don't want to go a little bit off topic, but I saw just going on the Ivies and the ACC. I saw a take on Twitter that Shane Thornton said that Princeton would be Duke by five plus. That to me was more absurd than my Notre Dame by five take. That Princeton would be Duke because if you by take the Notre plus. Dame team from last year for the through the first three quarters, that three first three quarters team could have beaten Maryland by five. But the lacrosse is a four quarter game. And Notre Dame had this impressive ability last year to choke away games in the fourth quarter. They were, they were great. It actually, they ranked number one in the t- country for choking games away last year. So, but no, I think is, is, is that the new Duke stat? Yeah, that's my stat. Cho- no, cho- chokes in the fourth quarter. Chokes in the fourth quarter. I mean, it down. Yeah, it was fucking insane. That would be a great stat. Oh my god! If that, if that, yeah. How many Dukes does a team have in a season? <laughs> yeah. how, many, how many, how many leads in the fourth quarter have they choked away? Are oh, you really Dukes that one? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Notre Dame was was dukes themselves at least like five times last year. <laughs> I love that. I'm keep that right right down that. Keep it in your back uh, pocket. Use it for later. But no, I think I, I don't know. I it it just I don't want to get too off topic or whatever. But I I just think it's crazy that they're probably only going to be like it looks like there could only be two ACC teams in. And the fact that Duke's playing great ball right now. I think the offense is really clicking. And the fact that I think Notre Dame's on this hot winning streak, doing everything they can to get into the tournament, and they, the loser of that game against next week might not get in. I think that's fucking crazy. I think there's right, probably well, let, no, but I think let's, should... let's just let, well hold up. Let's just do this right now because all right, listen. I know that there are a lot, and by a lot of people, I mean like maybe like two or three who like keep bugging us about this. But I know that there are people out there that are like, ah, oh, you guys are only talking about the ACC and and the Ivy. I think I think everyone at this point knows that the 2022 college lacrosse season. You've got Maryland at the top, then you've got the ACC and the Ivies, and then that's pretty much all there is. Like, yeah, like Georgetown's a very good team. Awesome. Uh, Jacksonville is a fun story. Great. But for the most part, it goes Maryland, tier of their own, and then ACC Ivy. Now, naturally, we have to figure out, okay, who's better, the ACC or the Ivy? Um, I think that so, you know, I, I, I think if, if we're talking about just like depth of great teams this year, like I, I would say that um, that the Ivy has is a better conference than the ACC this year as far as having more teams who can consider themselves to be May contenders. But do I think that the best teams in the AC in the ACC could still be the best teams in the like? I, I, I don't I don't see like Princeton and the Ivy being that much drastically better than the top teams in the ACC where it's like, oh, yeah, Princeton would spank Duke by five. Like, it, it's not that far off. No, no. I think that Duke... now now if we're talking about like Syracuse and like UNC, sure, because they For they're sure. like like Syracuse they're more stomped. Yeah, they're, even they're though Cornell team... overtime. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. But th- th- I just thought it off the top of my head, but, like, th- like they played in the Dome. <laughs> Plot twist. They played in the Dome. Yeah. I don't know. All, all I'm saying is, like, I-, I think that the that the Ivy is the better and deeper conference, but I also, like, I-, I like the Ivy will get more teams into the NCAA tournament than the ACC, but also, like, if we have ACC versus Ivy matchups in the NCAA tournament, like, I think that those ACC teams still, for the most part, win. I I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. Brown's playing really good ball, so I'm not going to count them out. Yale is a – they're a pedigree team. Like, they've been there in the past four, four or five years. So, like, I'm not going to count them out. But I think that 
Virginia and Duke, I think they go up against an Ivy team. They probably win in the NCAA tournament. Got to throw Notre Dame in that conversation. Uh, yeah, that, that that that's on me. That's on me. That Notre was Dame. that was disgusting. That that no no no. I, yeah, I, I I fuck that. That's on me. Notre uh, Dame's right out there. I. I the, I really believe so. I mean, I, like the loss to Maryland looks better and better every week, but we, I won't even say that anymore. But so I just need to do the math in my head. So breaking it down, besides the AQs, eight teams get in. I believe not nine, right? Isn't there? There's the the extra play-in games. I, b- I believe that there well, should well, be. Well, those would be like the SoCon and like, or like that would be like the MAAC and like the NEC, right? Like some like, okay. like, like so if I'm saying eight teams broken up and you're you're talking about the top conferences, right? Like the SOCOM won't get two teams in, in my opinion, anymore. I, well I, also the also the ACC doesn't get a a Q. A Q. So like they're so there's yeah, eight. So they're yeah. The way that in my eyes it should be broken down, besides like winning the tournament and getting in, like I think the the Ivies probably get four of those teams. Like I think they probably have four or five teams in. I, so I was thinking. I, if, I I I I think that they definitely have four. Four. four I think that you you could make you could make the argument for for Princeton to be in at the five right now, but like Princeton's like they have to hope that like some team looks like total dog shit in the two in the RPI. conference. I know I hate the RPI, but if they're gonna fucking look at the RPI, like how do you keep the number two team out of the out of the tournament? You're basically yeah, I mean, you're but, basically but, saying like but, the RPI is bullshit. Like you're basically saying for all well, the other I, years. I I I I, I, I agree. think that that's I agree. I, I, no. I, I, but I, maybe I, maybe this is what we need. What we need this year is for Princeton to not make the tournament, and then everyone can open their eyes and be like, wait, hold up, the RPI is total bullshit. Or no, maybe maybe it would be the other way around. Like, but either he, way, no, Pr- Princeton should be in the tournament, but like you can't. Yeah, the RPI can't say that you're the second team in the nation but you still don't even make your own conference tournament and then be able to like weasel your way out of that. See, this is where, this is where this whole fucking RPI, a niche Roth, looking at the fucking analytics. Like I just saw a niche tweeted out. Like, this is what I came up with for my bracketology. Like he's got, he's got three big 10 teams and open your fucking eyes, pal. Watch one fucking big oh, 10 game. Oh no, a niche. No. What, what, are we, what are we talking about here? Oh my what, god! What is he? So so he has well he has Maryland, Rutgers, Ohio State. So so he's got Maryland as one. Do you want me to just go through what he has? Is like the mock and who they who they would play. Yes, but also no because I love a niche, so I don't want to have to disagree with him too much. But sure, go ahead. Maryland won against either UMass or Vermont. That's low key a tough draw, kind of. Uh, two, we got Georgetown playing either Jacksonville or St. Bonaventure. Three, Princeton versus Utah. Four, Yale versus BU. Five, Rutgers versus St. Joe's. Upset. Six, Brown versus Virginia. Lars Tiffany revenge game. Cornell versus Ohio State. And then eight, Penn versus Duke. Notre Dame doesn't make it. That's where he, I know he's wrong. Yeah, I mean, there's no way that the Big Ten gets three in. The Big Ten. It should be four Ivy's. Four Ivies, yeah. three ACC, one Big Ten team. Like, in, like Virginia and Rutgers should get in, sure. Yeah, if, if – wait, 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 Like, I get – like, Rutgers is going to get in. It should be Maryland, yeah, Rutgers. Like, with, you know, one team gets an AQ, whatever, but, like, it should be – No, full- you, can't, you can't throw you, – you can't do three Big Ten teams. The, the Big Ten is by far the most dog shit conference – in all of college sports right now. I, I couldn't agree more. And it seems like in every fucking sport, we fall for this with the Big Ten. Where we're like, oh, no, they're really good. And then they get blown out on the big stage all the fucking time. I mean, yeah, yeah Ohio it, State wins a couple national championships. But, I mean, like, but if it's not like a national exposed, champ, but if it's like, not a national championship team, then they're fucking shit. It's yeah, like, they got they, shit pumped by have, Bama last year. The, the, the highest ceiling and the lowest floor. We just fall is, for the Big Ten in every sports because they beat up on each other and they're like they have all this money that like they're good. No, like they would get fucking dog dicked in the ACC. They got dog dicked in the fucking Ivy League. Um, like I said it, Rutgers would finish probably fourth in the ACC this year. I yeah I so they would they would fall behind they would fall behind Virginia Duke Notre Dame. 
And I don't know. Like, I feel like UNC would then, probably beat them. Yeah, UNC then, would beat them head to head. And then Syracuse steals one in the dome. Uh, now, granted, actually, may, okay, may, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. Because Who, what are you looking at? Who'd they beat? Well, UNC did lose to Ohio State 20 to 8. Yeah. So that's a. What day was it? What day of the week was it? Well, it was it was February nineteenth. Doesn't so count. You know you know what I say. It doesn't count. February nineteenth. I I feel like that was a I feel like that was a Saturday game. I'm trying to remember. Right? Yeah, that was a Saturday game. Um, but still. Eh, but it was at UNC. Uh, either way, yeah, I'm I'm perfectly fine with Rutgers as a fourth place team in the ACC. And also easily. Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. All right. That's all we have to say then. Yeah. All right. Fuck the Big Ten. Um, all right. So that's, uh, well, so that, so that's the Ivy. So again, we're, we're going to get into our Ivy league preview. Uh, we're going to have another episode coming out this week. It'll probably come out on Thursday. That'll preview a bunch of the conference tournament semifinals, uh, the Ivy league semifinals, they get going on Friday. So that'll be, uh, Brown and Penn, and then also Cornell and Yale, uh, one conference tournament that gets going uh, actually today. So if we're listening to this on Tuesday, uh, we've got the the Pat Lax. So the Patriot Lacrosse League or Patriot League Lacrosse. Uh, they've got an, another one of those uh, another one of those conferences. Oh, you know, we just talked about the Big Ten. We just totally glazed over the fact that it was the Big Ten quarterfinals. This oh, past I did it. Do you know what? Um, do you know what happened? Shout, uh, well, shout and, out to Michigan, seven and zero, finished the year below five hundred. <laughs> the most impressive thing I've ever seen in college across. Yeah, scheduler deserves to uh, to, to have the next few years off. Um, yeah, uh, Big Ten quarterfinals. Hopkins beats Penn State, and Penn State just finishes out the most like just demoralizing, embarrassing season of all time. Uh, and then yeah, uh, Michigan falls to Ohio State whatever. I, I don't even want to talk about the big 10 quarterfinals because it's terrible. Uh, Patriot league quarterfinals. They get going today on Tuesday. We've got Bucknell at Loyola and we've got Navy versus Lehigh. So uh, Lehigh and Loyola, they had a, they had a, a great game on Friday night. Yeah. Uh, that game, that game went to overtime. Uh, Aiden Olmstead and Kevin Lindley, like just two guys who, uh, you know, have really needed to, to lead the way for this Loyola team looking to make, you know, one last run at it, I think, uh, you know, to, to kind of because we're still on on the like the the tail end of that Pat Spencer era, right? Like mm-hmm. we, we've still got some guys who are there with with Pat Spencer and this is kind of the end of it. Um, so just one more kick at the can here for Loyola. I don't see them as national championship contenders, but still to have a good season. Uh, so Loyola, they pull out a big overtime win over Lehigh on Friday. Uh, I think it was Olmstead with the game winner. Um, also army was able to, to squeak out a, a nice, uh, nice tight win against, I'm, I'm pretty sure that that was the case, right? Army army with the one goal win over BU on, on Friday night. Uh, this, this could be, this could be bad radio, but I'm almost Lovely. positive that that's right. But I just don't want to move on until I know for a fact that I got that. Yeah. Army 15 BU 14. Um, so pretty good slate of Friday games last weekend for the Patriot league. Uh, so on Tuesday, again, we've, we've got Bucknell and Loyola Loyola off that overtime win and Navy at Lehigh. Now this one right here, this is. This this is a tough one for me because uh, obviously I'm a, I'm a little partial to Lehigh. Got a you know a bunch of bunch of Springfield guys on that team, so guys who you know I, I've I've spent quite a quite a bit of time with. Also a huge fan of of Sis at the Faceoff X. But I did mention last week that I'm buying all the stock on Joe Amplo and the Navy midshipmen after after head coach is in on the bench just putting up 335 like it's nobody's business. So. I feel like I have to go Navy in this one. It's, I'm not sure if they're not sure if there are any lines up quite yet. Um, but I feel like as, as I can't, I can't go against the head coach who just benched three thirty five. can't. And I won't. I mean, Xavier Arline too is playing in this game. Just a reminder. So yeah, you, you did. You did have top Navy 10 top 10 team with Xavier Arline with playing. Xavier Arline. So yeah, no, I like, I like Navy. I think I like Loyola over Bucknell and Navy over Lehigh for sure. Yeah, I, I think uh, you know I, I think that Loyola, 
as as long as you can keep riding Olmstead and Lindley, just let, let let them stay hot. I think they had nine goals between them on Friday night. So um seems like, you know, a couple guys who they don't want their time at Loyola to be over just yet. They still want at least a couple more games. So I think they get themselves at least one more game uh, heading into, well, then you go to the Patriot League semifinals and they get going on Friday. So uh, who knows? Maybe, maybe a few more games for them. But yeah, I like Loyola over Bucknell. And unfortunately, I like Navy over Lehigh. But that's just because I love the troops. Yeah, yeah. It's more of a troops thing than anything else. Proud to be an American, Dukes. Always. Or at least I know I'm free. <laughs> um, and anything else of significance happen uh, over the past week of college across that we need to get into before, before these Patriot League games get going? Nothing too dire. The one thing that I'll just say is I would like to see after Maryland kicks, just closing, closing point, when Maryland kicks the shit out of Johns Hopkins, I'd like to see – I'd like you to put on Ty Zander's notifications just to see how many Johns Hopkins – Guys are transferring. I mean, how do you even show up to that one, right? After after what just happened a week ago, like how do you how do you see that game and you're like, all right, let's let's do this again, guys. Let's. How do you go into the film room and you're like, we're gonna have to fix um, everything. Everything. <laughs> it's gonna be like everything. The, it's gonna be like the uh, it's always sunny meme where it's like them with like the the, the, the draw board and it's gonna be like <laughs> Charlie going crazy. But like, what do you even say? Like heading it, like pregame speech, right? Son, the boys are. Son, we're gonna have to score more goals at this team today if we're gonna want to win. It's gonna be like, like yeah, how? no fucking shit, coach. I mean, Johns Hopkins, like a, a, just one of the most historic programs in college across. They have to head into a conference tournament game, and their main message has to be, "Hey, let's just go out there and try hard." Yeah. You know, we try hard, can't control everything. Like all, all we can control is our effort, right, boys? That's that's the only thing we can control is how much effort we put into this one. Just go out there, try hard for your brother to to the left of you. Go try hard for the brother to the right of you, and and we'll see what happens. And then you're gonna get shit pumped by twenty again. <laughs> hey, <laughs> at least at least at the end of the day, they'll get they'll get shit pumped looking good. They always look good. I have to say, given that their color they look, scheme, they look, their color scheme is too good. That was say, I should have said something nice. That should have been my say something nice about Hopkins. At least you'll get shit pumped and look good when you do it. All right. A retroactive say something nice. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted the credit for that. All right. Well, uh, yeah. So that, that does it for our weekend recap or weekend roundup. Uh, and also, I guess, you know, a little bit of Patriot League quarterfinal previews. Uh, like I mentioned, we will be back on Thursday, uh, hopefully with Larkin Kemp. Uh, as, as we will be previewing the Ivy League tournament as well as the rest of the conference tournaments that get going. Uh, most of them all get going on Thursday. Make sure that you are following us on Twitter and Instagram. We are at the Crease Dive on both. You know the drill by now. Go on over to YouTube, smash that subscribe button on the Crease Dive channel. Uh, maybe even throw in a few likes and comments if you're feeling extra generous uh, as we get into our conference tournament slate of games. And as we head towards the NCAA tournament, every like and comment will go a long way. And in the meantime, we'll be keeping it low to high to the day we die. We out.